ladies and gentlemen, dear chairman, first of all, I would uh, like to thank you very much to invite me to give uh, this lecture on basic physical concepts and instrumentation in Petamar. I'm very honored to be here in Kuwait. It's the third time I'm here, and uh, with each time I'm here, I'm, uh, it, it's much more pleasure to be here and to come back. And so uh, the subject of this talk, uh, as we've already mentioned, is uh, instrumentation in PEDMR. And I like, uh, first of all, to remind that I'm giving this talk from a physician's point of view. So I hope all the physicists who are in the audience are not too disappointed that I'm not showing too much formulas. But uh, I, I, I'm looking at it from a historical and a practical uh, point of view in order to give the introduction for the for talks on PEDMR, which will follow. So everybody of us knows uh, the uh, success story of PET-CT, uh, where the first publication and the first prototype was uh, um, thought in 1994, funnily by the Geneva uh, team at that time. And uh, four years later, in the US, the first prototype was uh, produced with a, a fully integrated PET-CT system. And which went a big success, and now uh, in, in, in most uh, regions, uh, nuclear medicine department without PET, uh, PET CT is almost inimaginable. So let's let's look how it went in, in PET MR. It was a little bit different, uh, and when we look at the timeline, um, the the development uh, also began rather uh, rather early in the, in the 1997. Uh, 1997 with uh, yeah, let's say similar de uh, development of uh, technology in small animals and also uh, already in some clinical and preclinical applications. So uh, how did it start? If it starts, yes, it works. So um, the first publication on it was in uh, 2000, uh, in 1997 about the principle uh, from physicists um, who developed an imaging system basing uh, still on uh, photomultipliers. And uh, the problem in MR, everybody of us knows, photomultipliers in uh, a magnetic fields don't work. So they had to, to find a, a possibility to get the light out of the, um, uh, of the magnetic, magnetic field in order to have uh, a good image quality. And what they did, that uh, they used glass fibers, as, as we can see here on this example. This is a photomultiplier, which is on a normal, uh, which was based on normal uh, nat uh, natrium iodine uh, crystal. And then with fibers, they went back to the, um, <coughs> to the computing unit in order to generate the images. Some years later, um, still in the small animal uh, part, the first complete insert to a 7 Tesla MR was, uh, was developed from uh, more or less the same group from Tübingen, which had a 7 Tesla uh, M, uh, small animal MR, and they constructed an in, uh, insert to image whole mouses in the system. And how, how did it work? This is the, the image of it. It's the, the, the Klinsken 7 uh, Tesla. Here's the insert where you can put the mouse in. And the, uh, the, that were the first comparative images between uh, PET-CT on the upper row and PET-MR, where they had uh, uh, one mouse with a tumor, which was FTG avid. And they produced the first images on that. So how did it work uh, exactly? Here uh, you can see the uh, a view a little bit more exactly, the, the uh, stable magnet around about it, then um, a very small uh, detection unit for, for, for the PET, and then the fibers who were leading the image signal outside of the machine, and the mouse, and then uh, the RF coil. So uh, how did we get then from a small animal PET MR to human PET MR? Well, um, the first human PET-MR was not an integrated system. It was still working with the insert on a <coughs> regular uh, three Tesla uh, MR, which was also developed, uh, well, the whole system was also developed uh, by the same group in tubing in, in, in Germany. And they developed a, a head insert for <coughs> uh, this whole body uh, MR with a small, uh, very small diameter. Here are the detecting uh, tools into. And the first uh, thing they, they scanned was still mouses because it was not yet suitable to put a whole, uh, whole human being, that's clear, and even not uh, for the first tries, uh, they couldn't even put uh, a brain into it. However, the first uh, whole body mouse images they generated were, uh, were quite acceptable. 
with really an inline PET, uh, inline and simultaneous PET MR acquisition. And with, on the basis of this, prototypes, fully integrated PET MR systems were developed. So the uh, next step was then how do we come from small animal imaging to, uh, to human imaging, to have gantries where you can put into a whole human being. And then there are three different um, approaches. Uh, I think everybody of us knows them. Either you have sequential PET MR, so uh, a PET MR which is more or less close to the MR unit. You can do uh, integrated MR with small uh, detecting range of uh, PET and the future may be with new uh, detector technologies will be a PET uh, detector which covers the whole tunnel and uh, thus uh, you get a very good and very great <coughs> field of view for, for PET and MR at the same time. The first commercial PET MR uh, was put on the market uh, by Siemens which consists from a, a, of a three Tesla MR a full time of flight PET uh, system, PET scanner, both of them in a distance uh, of three meters, just in order to avoid any nuisance uh, uh, of the PET scanning by the MR uh, magnetic field. And uh, the first pr prototype was, uh, of these machines was uh, used at uh, Mount Sinai in the US. And uh, we in Geneva had the, uh, the great luck to be the first in Europe to work with this machine. And in our hospital, we had a little bit of a particular situation because there was no surface where we could put this machine. So everybody was happy we have this machine, but where the hell will we put it? And uh, the solution we choose there, it was we put it into a container. This is uh, a normal <coughs> design of a PETMR unit with a procedure room, the operator room, technical local, and other locals. And in Geneva, we, we did it like that. Here's, here are the plans. This is uh, the rooms. These are the rooms which are still belonging to the hospital. And here you can see the scanner container, which is just put adjacent to the hospital, which uh, for us had the big uh, advantage. When the PET, the PET MR was construct, constructed in the container outside of our hospital, and then it was delivered, ready to plug and play, we plugged it, we did, the, uh, we did uh, all the calibration work, and we could start right away very, very fast in uh, doing PET MR procedures. Oops. So, um, getting back to the technical challenges, this technique is possible subsequent scanners when you're working uh, with uh, conventional uh, photomultipliers and you can apply a uh, full time of flight technology. If you're doing integrated MR, you have to replace the conventional photomultipliers, which are on one hand, they are big, so already a conventional MR gantry has a diameter of, of some uh, 60 to 76 uh, centimeters at a maximum. If you want to do a P M, uh, uh, in addition to the magnets of them are still uh, PET, uh, PET detection systems, you get into big problems due to, the, due to the size. And the other one is, this is the detection when uh, you scan only PET, and this is the image quality when you scan PET and MR uh, simultaneously, so there's big distortion to the, to the magnet field from gradient coils. So what was done uh, by one of the under, uh, other vendors together with the tubing group once again, they uh, developed um, avalanche <coughs> photo detectors, which are uh, uh, now uh, onto its way to, to semiconductors, which are much smaller and which are not that sensible. They are still a little bit, but not that sensible than uh, the conventional photomultipliers. What are the properties of these uh, photomultipliers and uh, APDs? So, um, if looking, when looking at the size, they are much smaller, the gain is faster, rise time is a little bit slower, and they are not sensitive to <coughs> uh, MR, but on the other hand, with this, with this technology, you can't do um, full uh, pet MR. Uh, you can't do time of flight pet MR imaging. So uh, here, how they are consisting, they are uh, four, uh, Oops. There are four, uh, four, eight, eight, four, eight, um, arrays of these LSO crystals in the bases, and then the avalanche photodetectors, which are very stable to the <coughs> temperature. And this was then the first prototype which was uh, developed, as I said, with a head insert. They put 
these detectors into a head insert and the fibers outside for the computing in order to have a minimum of, of nuisance. And that were the first images which were, which were created. You, uh, they had uh, very good pet quality, very, uh, with a resolution down to one millimeter in this uh, phantom setting, and also very good MR quality. And this is now the, the idea how fully integrated phantom about that. This is now the, the uh, definitive design, how uh, Siemens is uh, delivering this machine with an integrated PET camera around the detectors, uh, uh, within the detectors and the gradient coils, uh, uh, out of the gradient coils, but within the stable magnets of the, pets, uh, of the MR system. Another approach was chosen by GE, and here I uh, thank for these uh, slides, which I got from Professor from, Zur uh, from uh, Schultes from Zurich. It's there they have the approach that uh, they are working with a full, uh, a normal time of flight PET CT in one room and in another room uh, uh, three Tesla MR, and the table can be dock undocked from one and dock to the other <coughs> uh, to the other machine and so you uh, you can avoid uh, movement artifacts other artifacts and you can uh, very good do very good software fusion of these two separate uh, modalities the big advantage is you can really do full uh, time of flight uh, pet ct with diagnostic ct you can use uh, ct for attenuation correction and uh, at the same time without having to uh, to call once again the patient you you can perform right away the, the MR and the next patient can already go to the, uh, to the PET-CT. So the, the, the use of the machines uh, can be optimized. On the other hand, the, the, the image quality between normal PET-CT and uh, normal PET without uh, time of flight and time of flight is somehow astonishing. So um, how about the surface coils? Because that's uh, the problem. I will talk on that also a little bit later. What uh, other problem uh, there? And therefore, uh, the sequential systems use a, a, a glove approach, so the patient is slipped out or into the surface coil, set up without any uh, displacement uh, when entering uh, the MR, which is uh, the uh, sequential systems. All systems, uh, in all systems, the vendors had to redesign the coils with a minimum of metal in the field of view of PET in order to, to avoid uh, attenuation artifacts by these uh, metal uh, uh, parts in, in the coils. On one hand, and on the other hand, you, you have to keep these coils as small enough because uh, there's attenuation all, all, also for very uh, low, but there's attenuation from plastic and MR doesn't see the coils, so um, in order to avoid also th so those artifacts in attenuation correction when using MRI for attenuation correction. And finally, which is common in all <coughs> uh, systems, you can identify uh, the location of the coil components using UTE or zero TE sequences. How does this work? Here, uh, one example of, a, of an uh, UTE uh, sequence on a, uh, on, on a chest. So you, you can see here the MR of the chest. And by this, uh, here you can see the uh, metal parts of the coils. And then uh, when you can see them by the UTE, you can also correct for them. So in summary, all vendors at this time use a state-of-the-art three Tesla MR scanners. Uh, this, the one from Sil, uh, Philips has uh, sequential design in the same room, which uh, allows for full-time flight uh, PET acquisitions. Siemens Healthcare uh, is at this time the only one which has a fully integrated PET MR, but uh, without the possibility of doing time of flight. And finally, GL Healthcare at this time has a sequential design in two different rooms, which permit full time of flight PET CT and MR, but finally, there are two strictly distinct systems. So, this for the technical part, and now uh, let me just talk uh, on some hot topics in uh, clinical uh, PET MR. One thing, and therefore, uh, it was one of the major reasons why we went also to uh, PET-MR is decrease of, decrease of radiation exposure, and then there will be also some talks on that uh, tomorrow. Uh, time consumption is a very important issue uh, in terms of patient throughput. Attenuation correction, there is still uh, much work to be done. And finally, what are the, the, the killer applications, the clinical applications for this machine? Now, we have some uh, experience with that. We have some ideas where we could go in this direction, and uh, the next uh, months and years will show if we are right with our predictions. 
And finally, what is the diagnostic accuracy compared to the uh, standard methods and certainly also costs? So just uh, some words on uh, radiation exposure. Everybody of us uh, knows uh, how much radiation is coming from bed. Uh, depending on, on the activity injected, we, we, we are up to, to, to five or a little bit more <coughs> uh, millisievert. New detector materials permit now to decrease the, uh, the injected evidence up to 50%. From uh, this is unchanged in the in, in the uh, PETMR system. From CT, also there, there are now Lotus protocols, and I think also uh, Philip will talk a little bit about that tomorrow, uh, this afternoon in in cardiac imaging. Uh, when, when looking uh, at low dose without contrast, you, you can go down to two millisievert. If you do full dose protocols, you have up to 10, 20 millisievert. So um, there's still uh, potential is pretty much coming from CT, but there is a potential decrease. And as we know, there's no irradiation from MR. When looking at time consumption, um, this is, in my opinion, the biggest issue. PET-MR needs to become very fast in, in order to have significant patient throughput. So you have to uh, have fast uh, sequences on the one hand side, and you have to limit the number of uh, MR sequences in order to have a diagnostic at a, a, at a reasonable time. Here was uh, one uh, publication from Germany who worked out uh, what, can, what one can do in whole body uh, MR at three Tesla, and they did uh, on the different sites on the body, they did uh, many, many uh, different sequences, and they end up with uh, 45 minutes. And when you have 45 minutes of MR, and then once again uh, 20 to 30 minutes of, of PET, you, you, you have uh, almost one or more uh, of, of PET MR acquisition. So we are in the old times of, of PET when, when PET was without PET CT. And this is uh, nowadays not really reasonable. So there's really a need for speed. And what uh, can, uh, when looking at, at this time, CT scan, it, it takes around about 30 seconds, and with contrast uh, enhanced CT, it takes uh, approximately over uh, two minutes. MR, as shown previously, can uh, reach up to 45 minutes. When looking at trunk, uh, now uh, with the new scanners, uh, you, can, you can, uh, can really get down uh, from 10 to 20 main, uh, minutes or 25 to 50 minutes when scanning the whole body, you can uh, get down to lower times, but overall for PET, uh, PET CT scanning right now on the new machines, you, you can do it in, in 10 to 15 minutes. If you do a whole body protocol, it still takes almost one hour. And the problem of PET MR, it takes at least a quarter of an hour up to one and a half an hour. So therefore there's some need for speed. Other question is how do we get from the uh, MR images to a reliable attenuation map, let's say it from, from MR sequences to, to pseudo CD derived from MR, how to, uh, uh, f to, to calculate the attenuation map. Uh, there are different uh, methods which have been uh, used and publicated in, in the early days. I, I don't want to go too much in the details there. One thing is uh, that you use, like for example in SPM, you use an atlas and you compare each patient's uh, data to one of the, the models which was derived uh, from an atlas and before, then perform then the attenuation correction. Another one is uh, tissue, uh, tissue classification which was done uh, for the first time in Munich and that means that they, they are using uh, two different MR series and I think this will be the way in the future. We just have to determine the MR series which are used. Different T1, T2 series in order to determine uh, lung soft uh, or lung or nothing air, soft tissue and, and bone in order to have a reliable attenuation map to correlate this, uh, uh, to correct then uh, the, the CT, uh, the PET data for attenuation. And here is uh, one of these cases on the upper row is uh, the, the PET CT from this patient, then the PET MR. Here we can see the uh, derived MR attenuation map and the image quality is quite comparable. So this was an approach which was uh, quite good working. Other thing, um, just here an example, uh, also they, they did uh, pulmonary uh, nodules. If the nodule is big enough, it can be recognized and deliver nice images. If it's small, we still have many problems in, uh, in lung. Other thing which was also uh, published uh, by, by the Munich group, uh, by, by the Tübingen group, sorry, uh, was uh, attenuation correction uh, with uh, pattern recognition. So they used, uh, using a, a, a complex uh, mathematical algorithm, 
what they did was uh, looking at, uh, at the brain at the MR sequence and they classified uh, gray matter, white matter and even uh, bony structures in air uh, by recognition of uh, their, um, how they be the behavior uh, to MR constructed the pseudo CT and compared it to the real CT and uh, when, when looking at these images it's quite comparable, quality is quite good and also uh, when looking at these brain scans quantitatively at this SUVs, first SUV me uh, measurements were not significantly different between them. What was our approach now together uh, with Philips is uh, that we went into these uh, different um, MR series and there we went uh, rather for, for Dixon sequences, a 3D Dixon T1 in phase, out phase, fat set, uh, which provides now excellent image quality uh, in comparison to the conventional algorithm with excellent resolution of, of 0.8 uh, millimeters. And uh, the acquisition time uh, when looking uh, at eight stacks, which covers really the whole body from the brain to, to mid-thigh, we are arriving at a scanning time from uh, two and a half minutes, with, which is really a reasonable and is um, from a scanning time comparable to the old uh, system, but image quality is rather better at the time. And as I said, uh, this was the beginning and now uh, what, we, what we are working is in-phase imaging, fat imaging, water imaging. From these we are creating the attenuation map and there we are getting to the corrected uh, PET images. Finally, in, in the brain, um, there were also uh, some people working um, in real quantification because if, if you're looking at, uh, at subtle changes in the brain, visual analysis only is uh, very often not <coughs> uh, uh, finding the diagnosis, so uh, you, you have to do quantification. Uh, these groups worked also with uh, compared transmission guided attenuation map with uh, MR divided, uh, derived attenuation maps using uh, T1 weighted MR, extracted the brain tissue, and then uh, calculated there from the, the attenuation map. And what, what they were finding was in terms of image quality, it was comparable when looking at transmission and MR guided. But what is uh, interesting, interesting, however, when looking at, uh, once again, from uh, uh, radiation or from, from a normal uh, transmission, uh, transmission and MR transmission, when then they subjected the two uh, brain scans uh, one from another, there were significant differences in uh, several regions of the cortex, especially here in, in the parietal and uh, occipital cortex. There were rather lower activity in the PET-derived uh, acquisition and in, 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 the, in the frontal part there were rather higher activities measured. One other thing is uh, how to image bone, which is still uh, very difficult in uh, MR-guided attenuation correction, but also there, there are now new uh, UTE um, sequences, sequences which are working uh, on that. And uh, when looking at these images, that gives really nice images of trabecular bone, of cortical bone, and there I think we are also on a, on a good way. So in conclusion, um, there was a rapid and parallel development of clinical, uh, of first preclinical and clin then clinical MR, uh, PET MR. There, we know that there are different approaches uh, to PET MR by the different manufacturers, which I mentioned already. Some issues are still challenging. Uh, one is uh, state of the art PET uh, technology combi uh, combined with MR. So, uh, how can we perform also in integrated systems one day? full-time uh, time-of-flight PET MR. There's clearly a need for speed in, uh, in MR because uh, when, if PET MR will survive, it's the MR part which uh, is very important in the PET. We are in the right direction, but M MR needs to get, uh, to get uh, faster. Finally, um, the clinical applications. On one hand, we uh, have a, a big profit by a decrease of the radiation exposure. Every indication where excellent soft, uh, soft tissue contrast is needed will be interesting for PET-MR imaging and especially there where MR is absolutely needed, CT is facultative, there PET-MR might replace PET-CT but at this time this are just a few indications 
And uh, on the other hand, uh, a question which is not resolved, I think, everywhere where PEDMR is used, how, how are the costs developing and how can PEDMR uh, can be reimbursed in the future? And uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, the different people who helped me to, to put together this presentation from our uh, department in Geneva, Professor uh, Ratib, the head of department, Habib Saidi, our PEDMR physician, uh, Professor Becker from the radiology, from Siemens Healthcare, uh, Thomas Brenneman, who provided uh, the uh, Siemens PEDMR uh, images, uh, Professor von Schultes from Zurich, who provided the GE images, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.